So we are going to talk about the four horsemen. Now, it's kind of it's kind of uh, this. The reason I chose this top or this title of the video is because it's so well known. The this concept or this phrase, the four horsemen, is so well known. It's um, it is commonly used when speaking of Revelation chapter six, but. Revelation chapter six actually doesn't use the phrase, the four horsemen. It just mentions this different things that John's seen and riders on a horse. And there's four of them in the first four seals. So we're going to go over that. So technically we're not going to, you're not going to be seeing in scripture anywhere, this actual phrase, the four horsemen. I hope you guys understand that. Um, but for the sake of hoping to educate as many as possible, it causes people to actually, you know, click on the video. Um, but we will be discussing those four writers that John saw in Revelation 6, as well as a whole bunch of other passages. So guys, this is our Investigating Babylon series. We've done seven on the past. We've done seven on the present. And then we're jumping into now seven into the future. So these future prophecies that I feel have not yet happened. So I know that, uh, you know, preterists don't like that idea. <laughs> they think a lot of this stuff has already happened. Hopefully tonight, as we go over some of these things, you'll see that it's definitely not happened yet. Definitely not. So uh, and more than anything, just the return of Yeshua hasn't happened. So clearly there's a huge disconnect in how they're understanding this. Uh, oops. Oops. Sorry, guys. Let's get to it. So seal judgments. This is the first where it starts off. Okay. We're going to look at the first seal. And that's going to be Revelation 6, 1 through 2. So this is the first seal. Then I watched as the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say in a thunderous voice, Come and see. So I looked, and I saw a white horse, and its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out to overcome and conquer. Okay, okay. Second seal. Let's break this one down. Revelation 6, 3, and 4. And when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. It's actually, it, it uh, depends on the translation you use. Sometimes it says, Come. Sometimes it says, Come and see. Then another horse went forth. I just don't want people to be confused thinking that the living creature is calling this horse from heaven and sending it from heaven. That's not what's happening. He's showing John different parts of the vision. So he's saying to John, come and see. And then they're, John and this living creature are, are watching this happen, this vision. Verse 4, the another horse went forth. It was bright red. Its rider was granted permission to take away peace from the earth and to make men slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Okay. By the way, I think this is interesting because the living creatures are talking. Um, in the Apocalypse of Abraham, we're going to go over some of those verses later this, uh, in the broadcast. In the Apocalypse of Abraham, there's a moment where Abraham is in this vision, seeing things in heaven, and he sees these creatures around the throne of God that are all jealous for God, and the angels have to like keep them faced away from each other. Otherwise, they um, they start to attack each other out of jealousy for the Most High. And I think that's interesting. They're kind of like they act. They show the behavior of dogs, which I think is hilarious um, because it's like is is truly you know if we're I, I joked with my wife a few weeks ago i was like look think about it like this the living creatures if that's what these are in revelation that we also see in apocalypse of abraham they're acting like dogs that are possessive protective and territorial sitting around the throne of the most high that's amazing because like that type of trait we see in dogs which are generic you know like i know that in our culture we call a man's best friend but they truly above any other animal they seem to have a, a wonderful sense of loyalty, protection, and um, uh, and just just a, a special uh, relationship with mankind. I think that's very unique. Um, they're easy to domesticate. They're naturally loving and accepting of mankind. And I just think it's funny that if we're made in the image of God, is it possible that you know these living creatures um, have that same disposition, that same temperament? They're like dogs. <laughs> they're like protective, loving dogs of the Father, and that's why canines are like that to us but at the same time these living creatures are described to have you know uh, a very unique chimera look to them which i think is interesting but that's not going to be the the bigger point of it now it's what i think is interesting is that these living creatures um i don't i don't like the translations that call them beasts because beast is a word that's typically used in prophetic passages for uh lawless people right that's why it we're going to go over the actual beast in revelation as well 9, 11, and 17, and, and it's because they're doing lawlessness and perse persecuting the saints. So I, I love the translation that calls them living creatures instead. But this living creature is actually talking in this vision, which I think is fascinating. And John is hearing him talk and, and you know, being shown something by him. Um, so let's go on to the third seal, and we're looking at Revelation 6, 5 through 7. 
And when the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, come and see. And then I looked and saw a black horse and its rider held in his hand a pair of scales. And I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and wine. Okay. All right. So it's interesting. All right. We're getting these three different uh, riders and these horses that are coming forth and having, they're causing effects on the earth. One's going out to conquer. Um, we'll, we'll look at the second one here. The other one's going out to take peace from the earth, uh, to cause men to slay one another. So this can be warfare. Um, also, what you would so some people would call commotions, um, civil war, strife, and then of course it's going to affect the economy. So this is this is a reference to scales, economic scales, and then of course the price of goods are dramatically increased due to inflation. So let's look at the fourth rider on the horse, Revelation six seven through eight. And when the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, "Come and see." And then I looked and saw a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed close behind. And they were given authority. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, by famine, by plague, and by the beasts of the earth. Now, I'm going to break these down. Stick with us till the end, guys. Um, I'll break them down with charts as well. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, so now we're on number five, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they had upheld. They cried out with a loud voice, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood and judge those who dwell upon the earth? Then each of them was given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers, were killed just as they had been. Okay, we're going to explain this as well. And then the sixth seal here in Revelation 6, 12 through 17. I saw the lamb open the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black like sackcloth of goat hair. And the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs dropping from a tree shaken by a great wind. The sky receded like a scroll being rolled up. Every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the commanders, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and free man hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to withstand it? How interesting has, he, has they actually used this pronoun of their wrath. The people that are afraid of Yeshua's return are actually speaking of it as their wrath. They know they know it's a father and son. It's not just the father acting like a son. It's a father and son and a bunch of angels. It's very, very interesting. Even the enemy knows the proper theology. So let's look at the seventh seal real quick, Revelation 8.1. This is what trips a lot of people up, up, guys. They think that Revelation is chronological. It's not. And this is what we're going to be showing you and explain a little bit tonight, how it... Um, it focuses on on a overview of events, and then it backs up, and then it focuses on from a different perspective, what I would call a different vantage point, um, a different set of events that are actually happening simultaneously. And it backs up and focuses on different aspects within those events and that overview. So right tonight, we're looking at the seals, trumpets, and bold judgments, which the seal and trumpet judgments are overviews. The bold judgments happens in all in, in a in a short amount of time, and we're going to explain that. I'm going to show you the breakdown, but in the following episodes, in the following installments of this series, we're going to be zooming in on more specific component pieces within these events that are happening to explain to you the first beast, the second beast, the mark of the beast, right? Um, the the ball top towers, the mother Babylon, and you know the 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 dichotomy of the kingdoms of Babylon versus the kingdom of God. So this is um, this right now. This episode is to try to open up your mind, if you will, to understanding the broad overview of how uh, many, many prophets have seen these end time events and how they explain them generally and broadly and quickly as far as um, they don't always zoom in as much as Revelation does. That's why Revelation is not chronological, because if you're writing a book, it's it's hard to keep it chronological when you have to stop and then go explain another character involved in the story while you've already explained a character that's going to do something from A to Z, well, these other characters are doing things at the same time. So the writer, the vision that John is seeing, he's got to stop and then let me focus and explain all the details of these other people doing stuff at the same time. So that's why it's hard to write the, you know, when you're seeing a whole bunch of moving pieces, it's hard to write them all down chronologically because they're all moving at the same time, culminating to the same finality. And that's what we're going to hopefully make simplified for you tonight. Revelation 8.1 
This is the last and seventh seal. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And we're going to explain all this. I'm just giving you a quick overview, guys. Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Okay, so this is this is a part. The reason why I'm, I'm going to back up now, because we just went through Revelation 6, and then I jumped to Revelation 8, 1. A lot of people don't realize that the seals start in Revelation 6, and then they go and they jump and end at Revelation 8, 1, and then a new segment of the vision happens in Revelation 8, 2. That's when the trumpet vision. A lot of people think that, it's in secession, and that's not correct. I just this is what we're going to be showing you tonight. A lot of people think that the seven seals happen, and then the angels are given the trumpets in Revelation eight two, and then they. But that's not the way the Greek works. The word Kai is used constantly in this uh, Revelation passage, this Revelation book, where that word can be translated as and, it can be translated as then, but it doesn't always mean that it's linking in chronological succession one event to another. It just means, oh, and I saw something else. And I saw that happening until it was done. And then, oh, I saw something else. And then I saw that happening until it was done. Kai, and I saw something else until it was done. And then I saw something. You see what I'm saying? So this is why we're going to take everything that John is seeing and we're going to line up the details. That's our context. And when we line up those details, you start to see that, okay, cool. Revelation 6. To Revelation 8 1, it's going to cover a broad swath of time. And then Revelation 8 2, he's actually, because remember, there's no chapters and verses in the original Greek. So in Revelation 8 2, he starts to explain a different part of what he's seen, which were the seven angels given seven trumpets, and they start to blow. So we'll line up the details of those seven trumpets. But real quick, let's jump into Revelation 7, because we just read all of Revelation 6. And then we see that the seventh seal happens in Revelation 8 1. But let's let's go back and let's read Revelation 7. 1 through 17 as well. And it here it says on screen, After this, I saw four angels standing at the corners of the earth, holding back its four winds. So that this is after this. So this is after he saw the sixth seal. I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back its four winds so that no one would blow on the land or the sea or any tree. I saw another angel descending, excuse me, ascending from the east with the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or sea or trees until we've sealed the foreheads of the servants of our God. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. That's 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000. And he goes into every single tribe and lists off these 12,000. A lot of people like to think, all right, well, what's up with this 144,000? Is that the only people that are being spared during this time? What does it mean to be sealed? Unfortunately, guys, we're actually not going to be talking about that tonight uh, because I've got so much other things to explain in the course of events that John has seen. A lot of people believe that this is um, because in the Hebrew, they they viewed the word, you know, the the idea of thousand and the idea of a twelve as being perfection. So a lot of people believe this is saying this is the perfect number that God has wanted from each tribe that's been taken part in the resurrection and being sealed with the seal of God, like uh, Yeshua references in Revelation 3, 10 through 12. Um, and like we also see this idea of them them coming out of Sheol, resurrected, being taken by the angels away from all these things that are happening from the sixth seal and the seventh seal. Okay, so just bear with me and let's go to Revelation 7, 9 through 12. And after this, I looked and saw a multitude too large to count. This would this would uh, line up with what we were just talking about, about the amount of people taken to the New Jerusalem, which is the first resurrection event that happens. Um, within these seals, uh, the sixth, seventh seal happened at the same time, and then also the seventh trumpet. We're going to explain and show you that breakdown here in a minute. After this, I looked and I saw a multitude too large to count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. It's the second as of chapter 2. Um, I think it's verse 35 through 49. The resurrection happens. Yeshua gives everybody palm branches. Uh, the palm branch, by the way, supposedly is the tree of life. We talked about this in our Honor Kings episode in the book of Enoch that explains this. Um, it's pretty fascinating. Apparently, the palm oil is amazing for you. And there's certain palm trees that actually grow fruit. It looks like grapes. And this is what Enoch saw growing off the tree of life. This is how the resurrected saints who get their robes of righteousness, their white robes, have access to the tree of life. This is that moment here. Verse 10, they cried out in a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Oh, that's two people. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they, God fell, and, excuse me, and they 
fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to God forever and ever. Amen. And then 13 through 17, it says, Then one of the elders addressed me, These in white robes, he asked. Who are they? Where have they come from? And then John answers one of the elders back, the angels. He says, Sir, you know. <laughs> So it's like he, it's like uh, he's evading the answer. And he's like, well, you already know where, who's the, who these people are. Why don't you tell me? It's kind of funny. And then uh, the angel replies to John, these are the ones who've come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. Never again will they hunger. Never will they thirst, nor will the sun beat down upon them, nor any scorching heat. Why are they serving him in his temple? Because they are part of the Melchizedek order. This is the promise of the new covenant. This is what you receive at the resurrection, Revelation 24 through 6. Verse 17 says, For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hallelujah. Amen. Good news. This is the good news of the kingdom of God to come, the promise of the resurrection, the glorified saints under the authority of Yeshua in this Melchizedek priesthood to be a part that is able to stand before you, God himself, Yahweh himself, the creator himself in his temple and minister on behalf of those who need it. Revelation 8, 1 follows up with this idea of John, what John sees. He sees this idea of the sixth uh, seal happening, which is the day of the Lord. We're going to talk about that because the sixth and seventh seal happen at the same time. And then he sees the seventh seal happen where there's silence in heaven for about half an hour. And, and without any supplementary verses that match this that I've ever found, um, it's my speculation that this is the actual moment where Yeshua is mounted with all the horses and they're actually about to come back. So this is why he, each seal has its own little vision with it. So there's like a seal happening. So each each seal that gets opened, there's a little mini, mini video teaser that, that John gets to see. Now, the sixth seal was a bigger one, was a much larger vision connected to that sixth seal and it makes sense because that great earthquake that has all the people cowering and hiding in the rocks and caves from the wrath of the lamb that's also the same moment where the resurrected saints are taken to heaven so that's why he's seeing a little bit of a, a longer vision associated with that and then you get to the seventh seal um, so we have all these seals broken down here and then you've got all of them happening from start to finish within a 42 month time period and we're going to go over why in a few slides later, please stick with us. Okay. Yeah. Um, kind of like that, Jeremiah 15, 16, that the seals, that's probably a better way to put it than I did. The seals have their own highlight reel, if you will, right? It's their own little mini uh, file, right? Their own little video file of what's going on with each seal. And it doesn't, and sometimes the events that are happening with each seal are overlapping with each other, because again, you're seeing a little, a little spot of uh events that are happening associated with these seals so let's let's go and i'll show you um the trumpet judgments so we're going to go into the first trumpet judgments revelation 8 6 through 7 and the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to sound them then the first angel sounded his trumpet hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled down upon the earth a third of the earth was burned up along with a third of the trees and all the green grass okay and by the way, we are going to dig into some of these trumpet judgments deeper when we get into following installments. So please be patient with me, guys. Like I said, we're we're doing it. We're going to look at some. Uh, we're going to we're going to dig deep on some topics, but we we're covering a lot of topics. There's a lot of things happening with these events. I can't cover it all in one video, so I'm going to do exactly what Revelation does, and I'm going to focus on certain things, and then another video, I'm going to focus a lot more on other things, and that way, when you step back after all the videos are done, you'll be able to say, oh, there's the grand storyline, it's all consistent, and if I want to focus on one piece of it, I have a video to do so, okay? So, trumpet two, this is Revelation 8, 8 through 9, and it says, the second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died. A third of the ships were destroyed. Sounds rough. Sounds rough. We're going to talk about what that is in future videos. Revelation 8, 10 through 11. Third angel sounded his trumpet. A great star burning like a torch fell from heaven, landed on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters turned bitter like Wormwood oil, and many people died from the bitter waters. Okay. We're going to talk about what that is as well. Um, specifically in the Eye of Raw and Eclipses uh, installment, I think that's part 19, that we'll be going over later. And Revelation 8, 12 through 13. Then the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun and moon and stars were struck. A third of the stars were darkened. A third of the day was without night. 
excuse me, what was without light, and a third of the night as well. And as I observed, I heard an eagle flying overhead, calling in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the remaining three angels. Now, a lot of people like to challenge this translation as far as is it truly an eagle or was it actually um, was it actually a bad translation as far as, you know, uh, like the depends on the translation. Some translation call it an angel that's flying over saying this and some call it an eagle. I don't know why. I don't think that's, you know, I think that's a horrible translation uh, personally, because it seems to be like there's there's only eagles or there's only angels interacting in this thing. Um, it's not an actual eagle. I, I would go with the translation that calls it an angel. But for whatever reason, this uh, this one that I chose I chose to say an eagle. But um, that's neither here nor there. Ultimately, let's go back here. But he's shouting that these trumpet blasts that just happened, it's about to be worse. Okay, so we just went through four trumpet blasts. But the next three trumpet blasts that is being announced that this is woe to the earth and those who dwell on the earth, it's about to get real. Okay, so let's keep going and let's see what the fifth trumpet's going to be about. Revelation 9, 1 through 12. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet. I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. It was given the key to the pit of the abyss. The star opened the pit of the abyss and smoke rose out of it like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the pit. And out of the smoke, locusts descended on the earth, and they were given power like that of the scorpions of the earth. We've, we have addressed this in part seven and part eight, I believe, or part six and part seven of the series where we talked about uh, chimera scorpions and also the king of Babylon. But we're, again, go check those out. If you haven't already seen that, we're not going to focus too much on those things tonight, but just give you an understanding of the overview of these trumpet judgments. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The locusts were not given power to kill them, but only to torment them for five months, and their torment was like the stinging of a scorpion. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle, with something like crowns of gold on their heads and faces like the faces of men. They had hair like that of a woman, teeth like that of lions. They also had thoraxes like the breastplate of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the roar of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, which had the power to injure for five months. They ruled. They were ruled by a king, the angel of the abyss. His name is Hebrew. Excuse me. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek it is Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to follow. Trumpet six, Revelation nine thirteen through twenty one, still has to do with um, the. Uh, the people that was just mentioned in the fifth trumpet, but now it's it's what they're going to go out and do for the time period they have. So then the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel with the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind, and the number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. Now the horses and riders in my vision look like this. The riders had breastplates, the colors of fire, sapphire, and sulfur. That's, uh, I guess, you know, in, there's. it's hard to say because sapphire can be in a lot of different colors. Um, a lot of people just assume it's blue, but sapphire really is one of the most abundant gems that comes in a wide variety of colors. But uh, So I'm not going to speculate. Obviously, we know fire is red or orangish color, so sulfur is like a dark yellow. Um, so uh, who knows who it is, right? Because I don't know what what he's seen and, and calling sapphire in this moment. The heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceeded fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that proceeded from their mouths. For the power of the horses was in their mouths and their tails. Indeed, their tails were like snakes, having heads with which to inflict harm. So this is what we've talked about this before, very similar to... Um, uh, this, this is the furthering description for my understanding of the locusts that we saw coming out of the pit in verses 1 through 12 of the same chapter. And so this is why they then go out to do things. Now, a lot of people will get confused by the four angels who are released. And it's to me, this is just like we see in the book of Enoch in chapter 88, where um, when an, an angel is uh, sent down to the earth and given a sword to the metaphoric animals in the parable that Enoch is seeing, and it causes civil war in the earth amongst the Nephilim. 
And so this is the same idea of angels always are interacting on the earth, but specifically uh, this particular angel sent down or these angels are released in this moment and it causes men to fight each other. It causes the armies of the earth to fight each other, but also it causes this moment here where you have the actual forces that came out of the pit. They, they've been given authority to go and do stuff and they basically go throughout the earth and kill a third of mankind. So that's kind of a big deal. That's a big deal guys. Cause I don't know what, I don't know the number of the population of the world by the time we get to this particular passage, but this is why the, the angel shouting in the previous chapter, whoa, to the earth. This is rough. This is going to be real rough. What, what's about to happen? So very interesting. Um, very interesting, guys, how this happens. But a third of the earth, that's a, that's a large number of people, guys. Um, so. We'll keep going though. Revelation 9, 19 through 21. For the power of the horse was in their mouths. Excuse me. The power of the horses was in their mouths and their tails. Indeed, their tails were like snakes, having heads with which to inflict harm. Now, the rest of the mankind were not killed by these plagues, still did not repent of the works of their hands. They, they did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, and stone, and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Furthermore, they did not repent of their murder, sorcery, or sexual morality and theft. So this, this is just, um, this is a rough rough and stubborn people group of lawlessness in the end times um, that even in spite of great affliction, they still don't turn to God. They still continue their, their ridiculously destructive, horrific ways, right? All the practices of Babylon, like we talked about in part 10 and 11, that's being ingrained into the society. So this is, that was the uh, fifth and sixth trumpets. Okay. And then the seventh trumpet is in revelation 11, 15 through 19. So it skips it skips in as far as the chronology of the actual layout of the book, skips over 10 and, and part of 11, and it goes right to chapter 11, verse 15 through 17. It says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and loud voices called out in heaven, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worship God, saying, We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was, because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. So that's why the seventh trumpet is so important, guys. I know a lot of churches teach that Yeshua is reigning right now. I Yes, I 100% agree with Matthew 28, 19 and Mark, Matthew 11. That Yeshua has been given all authority in heaven and earth. But what's prophesied of him in Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 110, 1 through 2, as well as uh, Paul reiterates in 1 Corinthians 15, um, 24, yeah, 24, that he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven above until all of his enemies have been put under his feet. And that's like kind of actually more literal than people realize because the, the assembling of all these armed forces for the that happens at the Battle of Armageddon, they're literally coming down and assembling into the geography where Yeshua is going to return with the warrior angels which is considered the place where the Garden of Eden was retracted, which is geographically and lo locationally would be the actual area where the temple in heaven above would be if that's the center of creation within the circular firmament-covered creation that we live in. So it's kind of funny that um, he's literally sitting at the right hand of the Father until his enemy has been put under his feet, like under his, like positionally, un like Yeshua is up there on the throne with his father, uh, Revelation 3, uh, 25, excuse me, 3, 21. And then, so under him is multiple levels of ferment till you get down to where we live in the earth. And then there's specific land directly under him. And that's that's where the Middle East, quote, Israel area is, and even the Valley of Jezreel where the armed forces assemble to fight him at his return. So that's the point of this being an actually a moment where he takes his rule at the seventh trumpet as the angels are announcing in heaven and has begun to reign not before the seventh trumpet at the seventh trumpet. This is, this is the part that I hope people would don't miss because I know a lot of preachers will like to say, Oh, he's reigning right now. He's reigning. He's reigning on the earth right now. This is, this is an argument of preterism as well as they'll say he's reigning on the earth right now. And I'm like, well, that is, that's horrible. Because that not only is oh, we do not see the promises associated with his reign, but there's still mass, mass corruption, violence, wickedness. Hap with the kings of the earth still rule. Um, the, 
how how in the world yeah i'm gonna i'm trying to actually assemble a conversation on my main channel kingdom in context with uh pastors that um believe in preterism and then some that don't and then myself and some other people have a conversation it's been a challenge uh getting everybody's schedules together um but we'll see we'll see if i can get that accomplished it might be five or six people on one broadcast a big roundtable discussion time about preterism pros and cons and we'll go over some verses and i would love to see their answer for this this particular verse um so let's look here at that was the seventh trumpet and it goes here in uh revelation 11 8 19 it finishes the nations were enraged your wrath has come so just like we saw them hiding from the wrath in the sixth seal here it is the seventh trumpet your wrath has come the time has come to judge the dead to reward your servants the prophets as well as the saints and those who fear your name both small and great destroy those who destroy the earth then the temple of god in heaven was open the ark of the covenant appeared in his temple and there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hell storm Okay, so that is trumpets one through six. And this also happens in a 42 month time period, guys. 42 months, just like the same 42 months of the seals. And we're going to compare those here at the end. But let's look at specifically that 42 months, because at this point, I'm sure a lot of you guys are asking, well, Sean, you keep saying this, but prove it. How do you know this is 42 months? Like what's going on? Like, how come it's not, how do you know it's not a hundred years? How do you know it's not a thousand years? How do you know it's not, you know, been happening for 2000 years, right? Because of the qualifiers, like I said before, guys, this is where we have to, we, we look at all the details given and we see which, what lines up. And then we say, okay, so these, so the, we give qualifiers of who these people are, the, the, the specific details that are mentioned on who gets to do what, right? So we, we heard about the first seal about the writer that was given a, a bow and a crown to go out and conquer. Okay. Another writer after him, red, red horse, taking peace from the earth, causing war, commotion, strife, and divisions. Third writer after him, the economy is destroyed, people and plague and famine, things are bad, things are happening. Fourth writer is two writers, death and Hades. Death is also the word for a battle in the Hebrew used interchangeably in the old testament. So death and Hades together, they ride out and conquer and do horrible stuff. Okay. So I'm going to break this down, but we're going to, we're going to talk about um, how a lot of these seals are happening at once. And then other seals are happening. And we'll talk about the grouping, if you will, of when the seals are happening at the start of the 42 months versus midway point versus the end of the 42 months. And also with the trumpets as well. Okay. And then we're going to get in the bold judgment set right after this revelation 13, one through five. So we're going to get that time qualifier of why I keep saying that both seal and trumpet judgments start and finish in a 42 month time period. That's three and a half years. Okay. So Revelation 13, one through five. And I stood up on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of the bear. His mouth is the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now the dragon was already introduced to us in the previous chapter. That's going to be Satan. Okay. Verse three says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Okay. Interesting. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And then they worshiped the beast saying, who's like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? So they're impressed with this guy. Okay. They think that he's powerful. They they're acknowledging actually the fact that, He's getting his power from the from Satan. We're going to talk about that in greater depth as we talk about Mother Babylon, the dragon's lair. And um, verse 5, he goes on to say, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue 40 and 2 months. All right? So here's our qualifier for this beast character. And 6 through 10 of the same chapter. The beast opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. That means his authority, his tabernacle. That's that's the temple in heaven that Yeshua is ministering in and them that dwell in heaven. So he's actually, you guys think about this. He's not just blaspheming the, the name of Yahweh. Okay. Like the literal tetragrammaton or Yahuwah or however you want to say it. He's not just blaspheming that. He's blaspheming the authority, the seat of authority, which is the tabernacle 
and then that dwell in heaven. So he's literally blaspheming the Father, the Son, and all the angels and their and their authority. He rejects it all. Okay. And it was given to him, this is the beast, to make war with the saints. So he rejects the Father, the Son, and the authority of all of heaven so much so he's trying to now kill the children of heaven, which are the saints, the saints on the earth, the people that are believers on the earth, right? That are promised in the covenant to become children of God at the resurrection and get to live in the kingdom of heaven at the resurrection. So he wants to kill those people. And it says he's given the power to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship the beast whose names are not written in the book of life for the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now guys, we're going to, we read later and we're going to cover this with the mark of the beast and the first and second beast uh, or the second beast, I should say in the future installments. But I just hope you understand the difference here between verse seven and eight. Verse seven says he's making war with the saints to overcome them. That's persecution. And then verse eight says all that dwell upon the earth will worship him. Well, that doesn't include the people he just made war with. Otherwise he wouldn't have to make war with them. Does that make sense? Okay. So this isn't like, this isn't saying he tricks saints. I've heard people say this before and it just boggles the mind. People try to say that he tricks the saints or he overcomes them by making war with them through deception to get them to worship him. So therefore now they're worshiping him in verse eight. And I'm like, well, bro, then no one's getting saved if that's what you think it is. That's not, that's not the story. The idea is that he does make war with them. It does. That's why it tells you. In verse 9 and 10, right? If any man has an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here, this idea is the patience and the faith of the saints. This is going to require you to be patient in spirit because you'll be undergo persecution if you're alive at this time in this moment. And then this will require your faith, knowing that the promises of God still stand, even if someone's putting you to death for your faith. Okay? So this is why this vision is a warning for everyone that's in these in the end of times, right? Second Ezra chapter 16, verse 70 through 76 it says, There shall be in every place and in the surrounding cities a great insurrection upon those that fear the Lord. I'll give you guys just a minute to think about what I just read. There shall be in every place and in the surrounding cities a great insurrection upon those that fear the Lord. That's persecution of the saints, guys. Everywhere. Verse 71, they shall be like madmen, sparing no one, but still spoiling and destroying those that fear the Lord. This is describing persecution, guys. For they shall waste and take away their goods and cast them out of their houses. Then shall they be known who are my chosen. They shall be tried as the gold in the fire. Hear, O you my beloved, says the Lord. Behold, the days of trouble are at hand, but I will deliver you from the same. Be not afraid, neither doubt, for God is your guide. And the guide of them who keep the commandments and precepts, says the Lord God, let not your sins weigh you down and let not your iniquities lift up themselves. So guys, I just, um, I, isn't it hilarious that I, I've, I think I said this last time, but I start my broadcasts and I have, I don't have any breathing problems at all. I, I talk about this with my wife, like, my nose isn't, isn't, I don't have like, I don't, I don't have nasal issues until I actually get on camera. It is the weirdest thing. It's been happening for like a year and a half. Uh, get behind me, Satan. Sit down, Satan. Um, it's just so funny that just the moment that I start the broadcast, suddenly I, I start getting like nasally. It's crazy. So here's second Ezra chapter 16. And is, this is just talking about a, a time that will come of great persecution. And you know, the, if you guys understand that this uh, context and the things going on in Second Ezra 13 through 16, there's a lot of end of times, the consummation of the times, day of the Lord, end of end of the days, prophecies that are going on. And he's just talking about the great persecution of saints at this time. In the Apocalypse of Abraham, chapter 30, verses 1 through 8, it says, He said to me, What your heart desired, I will tell you, because you've sought to see the ten plagues which I prepared for the godless nations. This is Abraham having a vision. God's trying to explain stuff to through an angel to Abraham in this vision. And God's now telling him, you know, all right, I'm going to show you these 10 plagues that I prepared for the godless nations. This is not for Egypt. This is for the godless nations. Okay. It says, which have been predetermined at the passing over of the 12th hour of the age of the earth. Hear therefore what I divulge. And so shall it come to pass. 
The first is the distressing pain of sickness. The second is the conflagration of many cities. So the conflagration is a word that means the burning of many cities. Okay, so that would be in line with what we saw from uh, the first seal, the writer that would go out, as well as the second seal, the writer that goes out and causes, and as well as the, the persecution that we see um, that begins with the beast for 42 months, begins with the beast who's in the authority of Satan to go out and make war against the saints and to overcome them. So this is going to be a, a variety of the, the first is one of these sicknesses of the godless nations um, that he's going to be that are d determined okay for for and unfortunately believers live inside these godless nations this is just the sad reality of this okay so i don't i would pray that everyone would would walk in faith and walk in you know to be protected from these things but i don't know how that i honestly don't know how that's going to play out i don't know if every believer is going to be supernaturally protected from these things because you worship Yahweh, but you live in a godless nation. Okay. So I just don't know how that's going to happen if, if it will at all. I, we just read from Revelation 13, you're going to face persecution from the beast himself. And second is 16 read the same thing. Okay. But it, these are the 10 plagues that are mentioned. The first one is distressing pain of sickness. The second is conflagration of the burning of many cities. Third is the destruction and pestilence of animals. The fourth is the hunger of the whole world and its people. Well, that happens because you just killed all the animals, okay? And especially if you're sick and there's cities burning, obviously your economy is in shambles. Uh, the fifth is destruction among its rulers. By destruction among its rulers. I know a lot of people are sitting there going, man, we, man, this sounds like today. Eh, not quite. We, we're not like, we're not quite at the place of um, the, the cities being burnt down. And this is where I think we're, we're this is happening over the 42 months that we saw from the sixth, um, the sixth trumpet, right? After the Apollyon and these other, these other 200 million things come out of the pit and they go out and they start doing all this horrible stuff to kill a third of mankind. That's the 10 plagues that I think is being described here in the Apocalypse of Abraham. Um, yeah. So this is where the fifth plague is called the destruction among its rulers unfortunately it looks like people uh certain countries like canada and australia are trying to get head start on this on this plague just all on their own it's so sad by earthquake and by the sword and the sixth it, so this is uh, this is really interesting guys i don't know if people catch this or not but it says the fifth is by destruction among its rulers by earthquake and by sword that's crazy so your governments turn on you by what earthquake and sword whoop yeah, did you guys know that they have technology to have to create earthquakes. They've had it around for a long time. I didn't have time with, I have over a hundred slides I'm trying to get through tonight. So I didn't have time to do a full on breakdown on that super weapon, but yeah, they've had that kind of thing, a kind of military weapon for a while. The sixth plague is the multiplication of hail and snow. Sounds horrible. It's funny. Actually, I saw there's videos and I, I don't know the, the truthfulness of all this. There's videos that it, people record themselves asking Siri um, about um, deadly storms that happen in the future. And it's, it's fascinating because Siri respond, they'll say like, uh, what happens, you know, what happens to, um, you know, the Netherlands in 2029? And Siri says, you know, the great snowstorm of 2029 killed a million people in the Netherlands. And, you know, what I'm saying there's one about like 2024. There's supposed to be an, uh, six feet of snow that drops in Texas and kills like a million people. Um, just crazy, crazy stuff like that. Right. And this is series response are these crazy events. And she says like, there's a great hurricane that happens at this time for this nation. There's a great earthquake that happens in this nation at 2027, 2033. There's the great earthquake that happens in Europe. And, and it's fascinating. I, I don't have the video queued up because I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's been doctored or not, but it's really interesting to see if that's the case. If you have a Siri at the house, you know, um, maybe try it. See, see, Hey, uh, when is, when does Texas get destroyed by a snowstorm? And if she answers something like 2024, it's really weird. Uh, but I just think it's, it's interesting that multiple times in prophecy, it talks about hail and snow being a plague that actually destroys stuff. So, uh, the seventh is wild beasts will be their grave. Uh, the eighth is hunger and pestilence will alternate with destruction. And the ninth is punishment by the sword and flight and distress. And the 10th is thunder and voices and a destructive earthquake.
Okay, so these are the ten plagues, and um, this is very interesting from the apocalypse of Abraham. Revelation 11, 1 through 6. Now, the reason why I mentioned that stuff, guys, is because that's we just read about. I don't I don't know how good you are with putting together ideas, and but we just read about you know, the seals that were opened and these these riders on these horses, it doesn't technically call them the four horsemen, but these four different scenes that John is seeing. The first one being that this guy is given the authority and power to go out and conquer and overcome. The second one is that there's another rider and he's given the, the, the ability to cause war amongst people um, and take peace from the earth. And the third one is economic destruction. And the fourth one is death and Hades together, go out to conquer, kill people. And I just think it's interesting because um, I'm going to show you here in a minute how all those are happening at, actually at the same time. And this is this is all happening at the start of when Apollyon is released with the 200 million things that are with him to go out and kill a third of mankind on the earth. So these are, and this is actually, I didn't have time. To, there's so much of this, guys. I tried to shrink it down and I was like, I had all these other slides and I had to, had to change it and I had to be like, okay, I've got to make this simplified. I've got to make this simpler so I can go through it. I don't want to lose people. But there's so much that is being described about the end days and all these events leading up to this moment. Second uh, Baruch chapter 27. We've done we've covered this in honor of kings in the past, but second Baruch chapter 27 also covers this idea of all these things that are happening at the end of days and they're interchanging with each other. All these bad things that mentions off the same things that we just read from Revelation the Apocalypse of Abraham. The idea that there's pestilence, there's earthquakes, there's famines, there's, in fact, it specifically says there's attack of the specters, which I think that's what those are in Revelation 9 that we saw. But it says in the, the Baruch prophecy that they're all kind of intermingled with each other, all happening at once and at different places all over the world. So this is why when John's seeing this stuff, he can't write it down chronologically because he's explaining this like, oh man, this is happening from this perspective, from this particular plague. And then at the same time, another thing is going on, but it's also affecting the world. And we haven't even started this, and we're just now starting to talk about the two witnesses and what they can do simultaneously while all these other things are going on. Okay, so that's what we have. Revelation 11, 1 through 6, it says, And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. The angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, with which is outside the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty two months you guys see that so 42 months how much time did we get for apollyon to over to attack the saints and to go out and try to conquer people and have a whole the, the whole world worship him obviously besides those who fear the lord he was given 42 months that was the time he was given to have authority to have great authority given to him by the dragon 42 months in the same 42 months the enemy pops out with his little minions the father comes up with these two amazing witnesses to fight back. I think this is fascinating, guys. So it says, verse 3, And I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks, standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So is it possible that what we just read from Apocalypse of Abraham chapter 30, these ideas of these plagues that are happening, these, these plagues that are reserved and predetermined as the prophecy says for the godless nations are literally in the hands and the disposal and the discretion of these two witnesses. The enemy is trying to do something. The two witnesses try to stop him. Be pretty fascinating. Pretty fascinating. Just a thought. I don't know how that plays out, but just, just a thought. So let's keep reading, though, about these two witnesses. And says, and when they finish their testimony, that means after the 42 months, they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. He shall overcome them and kill them. Okay. Their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also a Lord was crucified. All right, so it's not technically Sodom or Egypt. Those are two different places. It's spiritually, it's meaning metaphorically, because of the great apostasy, the great wickedness that's going on in Jerusalem, where Yeshua was crucified. This is where these two witnesses will show up. This is where they're going to be killed by the by the beast, uh, by the one that came out of the bottomless pit that we read about in Revelation 9. And also, this is... Um, 
this is where they'll, they'll lay for three days. In verse 9, it says, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see these dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. How interesting, huh? After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying up to them, Come up here. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Their enemies just watched this. It's fascinating. So as we read earlier, guys, what happens? The, what's at the seventh trumpet, which happens at the end of 42 months, like I talked about? It's the resurrection. And we're going to get into that. That's why these two guys are resurrected at this time. It's at the end of the 42 months and even plus another three and a half days. And that's why they're getting resurrected off the street. They weren't even buried. Revelation 17, 8. So this is what we talked about. The guy that, that was given authority in Revelation 13, the one that is sent out of the pit, the one that just mentioned in Revelation 11. It tells you directly who the beast is in Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. That's the word that means destruction. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, so they're going to be amazed. They're going to marvel at this cat because they're not believers in Yeshua. They're not they're not people that are written, whose names are written in the book of life. Um, they've rejected that. They're easily deceived. Uh, they're extremely gamma because they you know. They reject truth, and so they fall for this deception and wonder after this character that comes up out of the beast, or excuse me, out of the pit. So since we talked about the trumpet judgments and the seal judgments taking place over a 42-month time period, as well as the reign of the beast that comes up out of the pit, as well as the prophesying of the, the two witnesses all happening in this 42-month time period, let's look at the bull judgments because these happen at the end of that 42 months, all right? Let's look at bowl number one, Revelation 16, one through two. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of God's wrath. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and, and loathsome malignant sores broke out on those who had the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. Okay, guys, so this lets you know right off the bat that these, <laughs> they already have the mark. So we just that means we've already gone through the events of Revelation 13. They've already gotten the mark that me and we're going to express this more as we go over the actual video uh, or actual installment mark of the beast. But this these are people that already have the mark, okay? So this tells you right here this is not happening at the beginning of the 42 months. Okay? And I'm going to show you this is all happening at the end here. Bowl number 2, Revelation 16 30, verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it turned to blood like that of the dead and every living thing in the sea died. Well, that sounds horrific, guys. Because that means everyone, all the fishing industry, I mean, talk about more hunger, talk about more problems. Even already there's 200 million uh a third of the earth is being killed. A third of this of the fish in the sea had already died 42 months earlier from uh, one of the trumpet judgments, and I'll, I'll explain that in a, in a future episode. I apologize. I can't explain every single thing in this particular video. I know a lot of you might be excited for that, but please stick with us and see the rest of the videos. But this now, everything in the sea is done. But the, well, this is not good. This is just like one of the plays that we see. You know, Moses was given the power to do. Same thing with the two witnesses. Like they're getting the tap, but this is an angel. These are not two men on the earth that are called prophets. These are. An, this is an actual angel pours his bowl of wrath into the sea it turned to blood like that of the dead and every living thing in the sea died so now we got a huge issue for the perpetuation of mankind on the earth if if everything in the sea dies your ecosystem is going to all be destroyed within a matter of months everyone's going to die this is why the kingdom of god literally saves the earth and he's stopping he's he's destroying the system of babylon that's been set up that is ruling the earth at this time. So this is, guys, this is because of the godless that Yahweh is pouring out his wrath in different ways through these different seal, trumpet, and bull judgments. This is not because, this is not as, as a result of 
Christians who sometimes sin and mess up. No, guys, this is a result of blatant kings of the earth, idolatry, godlessness, Satan, the beast, the second beast, who's the false prophet. Because of their horrific uh, acts, their occultic ways that they're perpetrating, and they've ramped up times 100, and now they've gone full-scale war against all believers across the earth. Yahweh is responding. So now this is getting to a point where he's going to take away all of their abilities to live. And then he's going to come down and save those who's, who are his. Bowl number three, Revelation 16, four through seven. And the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they turned to blood. Just in case you thought you were safe in a landlocked area with mountain spring water coming out. Nope, you're not. This is why in Ezekiel 47, the, the river of life that's coming out from under the throne that has the trees of life that grow alongside of it. It says in verse 12 that it goes out to refresh the water courses of the war of the earth. Yes. The, the kingdom of heaven that comes down and there's a river of life that comes out of the kingdom of heaven refreshes and cleans up heals the water courses of the earth because they've been destroyed in this moment on the day of the Lord. I'm sorry. I didn't read all that. I heard the angel of the waters say, Righteous are you, O holy one, who is and was, because you've brought these judgments. For they've spilled the blood of saints and prophets. Okay, so again, we also, this is telling you, this is at the end of this process, at the end of these 42 months. This is when the judgment, the wrath of the Lamb actually happens. That's why they're called bulls of wrath. Because the, the, we just read, Revelation 9, Revelation 11, Revelation 17, this beast that comes out of the pit, he's given 42 months to make war against the saints. So he kills the saints. And this is what the angel's responding to. We're, and he's saying, your judgments are righteous, O Holy One, because they've spilled the blood of the saints and prophets. You've given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar. It sounds real salty, right? And I don't mean like blood tastes salty. I mean like this angel sounds salty. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they get, give them what they deserve, Father. It's good. It's just, it sounds so, so hilarious. Um, and, but this is, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to make light, obviously, of such a, of such an amazing concept, but, this is the ultimate moment where the father and the son and through the, through the son, the father is exacting justice on the earth. And, and, and he's literally, he's going to stop this nonsense forever because these guys, they drink. Okay. So let me put this in the right perspective for you. The ways of Babylon, like we talked about in part 10 and 11 of this series, the practices of Babylon, part of it is this, this uh, idea of occultism and witchcraft and the drinking of blood. It's, it's a part of their belief system. I think they gain power from it. There's I, Like I showed in, in those videos, there's even people today that the media covers out. We're not talking about hidden underground little sects or cults. Like these are out and out in the open, being covered by the media, little clubs of people that drink blood because they think it's going to give them a better life force and help them. They call them like vampiric clubs. This is, this is what they've been doing for memoriam, guys. This is what they've been doing since the days of the Tower of Babel and even before. It's the occultic worship, uh, and it's a part of this is the drinking of blood. This is why Yahweh tells us in his law, Leviticus 17, and reiterated by, the, by the, uh, the apostles in Acts 15 as they were teaching new believers, stop drinking blood. Don't, don't do it, right? Because that was a part of the occultic practices at these temples with these idols to, to do this. So... He's like, oh, you like drinking blood? How about I? that's all I give you to drink? Think about the irony here of the father being like, oh, so you want to kill my people, my prophets, and you want to drink blood, of the blood of children? Okay. How about that's all you have to drink? It's crazy. That's crazy. But he's going to come heal the earth and save the saints and, you know, and save a whole bunch of people as well with Leviathan and Behemoth. But ultimately... The bad guys, right? This is a judgment on the godless. And so verse 7 says, I heard the altar reply, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So that's the third trumpet, or excuse me, the third bowl. Now the fourth bowl is Revelation 16, 8 through 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. It was given power to scorch the people with fire, and the people were scorched by intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues, yet they did not repent and give him glory. And they're going to realize they don't live on a ball on earth on this day as well because <laughs> the power of the sun is going to be brighter because he's opening up the firmaments 
um, to come through. And so there's less filtering layers for the for the heat of the sun. So it's going to be interesting. Bowl number five, Revelation 16, 10 through 11. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. And men began to gnaw their tongues in anguish and curse the God of heaven for their pains and sores, yet they did not repent of their deeds. So I think this is fascinating because I personally feel that this is going to be the same palpable darkness that we read about in the wisdom of Solomon chapter 16, as well as uh, you know the, the ninth plague in Exodus, I think it was chapter 9 or 10. I think it's going to be a plague of darkness, just like you saw back in Egypt. Specifically over the kingdom of the beast. The throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. And I don't think it's just because the, the sun and moon and the luminaries are going to be affected. I think there's going to be a tangible darkness. And I, unfortunately, this is just my uh, my speculation. Okay, I can't technically prove that. I know there's going to be physical darkness because the luminaries will be diminished on these day, on this day. But as far as the type of darkness that can be felt where no light's getting in and you're, you can't even move because you're just in darkness, it's like he turned off creation. This is supposedly what happened to the Egyptians in the ninth plague. I think that's what's going to happen again, personally. The sixth bowl judgment, Revelation 16, 12 through 16. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Okay. So this is them already mobilized and already, because if you read other places where the three demons went out to gather the people, they've already mobilized, they're already heading to the Valley of Armageddon. Okay. So there's a, well, I do believe that's the area that they have um what how do i say this where the beast is which is in uh he's sitting in jerusalem by the way it seems like um that's going to be in darkness but the valley of jezreel where all the armed forces assemble to go to um to go to prepare and assemble and fight in the battle in the valley of armageddon to fight Yeshua's return that's north of jerusalem like two or three hundred miles so and they would need to come over the euphrates to get there so that's that's part of this bowl judgment. And then verse 13 through 16, it says, I saw the three unclean spirits that look like frogs coming out of the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. These are demonic spirits that perform signs and go out to all the kings of the earth to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who remains awake and clothed so that he will not go naked and let his shame be exposed. And they assemble the key. That, by the way, that means keep the commandments, just in case you didn't understand that idiom. And they assembled the kings in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So these guys who are been assembled by the beast these three demonic spirits coming out of the the dragon which is satan the beast and his false prophet and so therefore they're they've assembled these armies from the ten kings to bring their armies to try to fight yeshua's return because they know that, the, that that they know what's going on this day okay um and personally this caveat here is given after the sixth bowl is poured out This they've already been they've already um, been preparing for this for a long time. Let me just put it like that, right? This is the purpose of them trying to control the earth. And during the forty-two months that they went out to to conquer the nations and maintain control, this was the purpose of them assembling that allegiance of all these other nations and their armies because they need fighting forces because they're so ridiculous that they think they can actually win against Yeshua returning. So they're actually going to fight him. It's crazy, crazy guys. Bowl number seven, 17 through 21. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came from the throne in the temple saying, It's done. There were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and a great earthquake, the likes of which had not occurred since men were upon the earth. So mighty was the great earthquake. The great city was split into three parts. The cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And then every island fled and no mountain could be found. The great hailstones weighing almost a hundred pounds each rained down on them from above. And men cursed God for the plague of hail because it was so horrendous. By the way, this is actually in Job 38. I believe it's uh, verse 21 and 22 where Job asks, or Yahweh asked Job, do you know about the hell I have reserved for the day of battle? The hell that in the heaven that he has reserved for the day of battle. So it's pretty fascinating. Apparently, there's a, a compartment within the firmament above where he just has this hail stored waiting specifically for this day because he knows it's coming. And the book of Enoch, chapters eight, 72 through 82, talk about these type of places where there's these uh, 12 gates that are encompass the circular firmament over the circle of the earth. 
and that there's 12 gates total east south north and west three gates per per directional point and that some of them produce hoar frost and hail and bad weather and stuff so it's just interesting that he's like uh he just already has this particular type of natural calamity ready for the day of battle and it reminds me of joshua chapter 10 at the battle of the, the five emirate kings that attacked joshua that day they were routed um the israel did win but it's, it tells you that hail fell from heaven and killed more of the Amorite army than, than Joshua's troops did. So it's pretty fascinating. So those are your bold judgments, guys. These happen all on the day of the Lord, the day of wrath. And I know a lot of people like to say, well, Sean, I thought a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years. I'm like, okay, well, guys, that 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 phrase cancels itself out. No, this is not all taking place over a thousand years. Because again, with the seventh trumpet, that's the great resurrection of the saints. People aren't being resurrected for a thousand years. It's one day. It's a specific day. It's what's called the last day. And this is a day that the wrath of the lamb actually happens. So this is a very important big day. And this is why all this stuff happens. All these bowls are poured out in the same short span of time. And it's, it's severe. It's very severe. Seal number seven. So at the last seal, it's actually uh, six and seven to be to be technical, but seal number seven is happening. That's culminating. The seals are culminating at the very end when the seventh trumpet is culminating. Okay, that's the end of 42 months. And then at the very end of the 42 months, all seven bowls happen. So let's look at this this part, this process of when Yeshua comes back at that seventh and last trumpet, which was Revelation 11, verses 11 through 15. And he begins to reign, right? So he's going to come back and he's got to address Satan and the beast, the false prophet, and all the people that are trying to fight him. This huge, horrible fourth kingdom that's risen. Daniel chapter 7, 19 through 23. It says, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass, which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in its head, did we read that from Revelation 17, also Revelation 11, Revelation 13? Did we read that about the beast that had the ten horns? It's interesting. Um, and he says that uh, the ten horns that were in his head and the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things. The, all, guys, remember the word horn in these prophecies refer to pe- uh, places of authority. Okay. Um, who, let me go back and start with verse 20. The ten horns that were in his head and of that which came up and, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Okay. So it's interesting. So of this fourth kingdom, you've got this, this horn that comes up. All right, we're going to talk about that kingdom it's, you know, in future videos because it's the, the, the whore that rides the beast. Okay, But this little horn this, that's more stout than this fellows, it comes up and it's actually going to make war with the saints and it prevails against them. Just like we read in Revelation uh, 13, verse 7 through 10, 6 through 10, verse 22. Until the ancient of days, so this happens, he, this, the beast, the little horn, he makes war against the saints until... The Ancient of Days comes, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Okay, so this is a broad statement that just encompassed the 42 months of the reign of Apollyon, leading to the return of Yeshua, and the resurrected saints happening, and then they're now a part of this ruling class with Yeshua to rule and reign for a thousand years, and the beast and his kingdom and his cohorts are judged. So this is all being summarized very, very quickly in verse 22. Verse 23 says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. This is the the kingdom that has authority over all these things, that is controlled by the dragon, who gives that authority to to the actual beast of Revelation 13. So this is what Daniel is seeing here, verse 23 to 27. In Daniel 7, he goes, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which should be divorced from all kingdoms. I just read some of this, sorry. Um, in verse 24, it says, The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first. He shall subdue three kings. He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. 
and they shall be given unto his hand a time and a times and a dividing of time. So I know a lot of people love to take this verse and say, guys, this has already happened with Pope, somebody that in the 12th century, I think, or the 10th century, because he tried to change the Sabbath and he changed the calendar to the Gregorian. Guys, that's not the context of what's happening here. This is not the context. We just saw a few verses earlier that this this particular kingdom, this fourth beast and the fourth kingdom and the horn within this fourth kingdom is destroyed by the most high coming in judgment. So that, that didn't happen in the 10th century. Okay. I know that, you know, we have, we have a lot of good brothers that we, we love and respect that um, have very different views. And I just, I know there there's a lot of things they try to push everything from the Catholic church into these views, but I just want to say like, these are there's qualifiers to these passages and they're huge qualifiers. This isn't stuff you even have to speculate about. This is like huge qualifiers. These passages that this is the return. The angel of days comes judgments given the authority is given to the saints. I mean, that's the first resurrection. The rule and reign of Christ for a thousand years. It's, I mean, this is the return, the second coming of Yeshua. That is what stops the persecution of the wearing out of the saints of this fourth kingdom and this beast that rules this fourth kingdom. Verse 25, he shall speak great words against the most high and wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws. They shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of time. But the judgments, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the earth. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. Right, that's why we part of the resurrected saints are made into a Melchizedek priesthood that rules and reigns with Yeshua for the millennial reign, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Zechariah 14, 15 through 20. The Yeshua and the saints that are resurrected, they rule and reign from within the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem, and everyone outside the kingdom, all the other lesser kingdoms of mortal men have to come and pay homage to the new Jerusalem and learn the ways of peace. They have to learn God's Torah, his instructions for right living. So they stop killing each other and they can actually learn to walk in love with their creator. So that is the type of dominion that the resurrected saints enjoy with Yeshua. All right. So, Apocalypse of Abraham 31, 1 through 8 says, And then I will sound a trumpet. So this is, again, when this dominion is taken away from that beast and that kingdom, at the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, this is here, right here in this chapter. And then I will sound the trumpet out of the air, and I will send my elect one. Is Yahweh sending himself? No, he's sending his elect one, Yeshua. Having in him all my power in one measure, he shall summon my despised people from all nations. Uh, that sounds beautiful, right? And I will send fire upon those who have insulted them and who have ruled over them in this age. This is Revelation 11, verses 19 to 30. There was, there was thunderstorms, there was plague, lightnings, and a great earthquake. And we're going to read about the physical fire that comes down with the angels as well. It says, I will give those who've covered me with mockery to, to the scorn of the coming age, and I've prepared them to be food for the fire of Hades, meaning they're going to be destroyed. Um, and perpetual flight through the air and the underworld. They shall see the righteousness of the Creator and those whom He now honors, and they shall be ashamed, for I had hoped that they would come to me in repentance rather than loving strange gods. But they forsook the mighty Lord and went the way that they willed to go. It's crazy. So, Revelation 19, 11 through 15, this is this moment where, like we just talked about, that the elect one, Yeshua, is sent with the full power of the Almighty inside him, okay, to come back and stop all this wickedness and destruction on the earth. 11 through 15, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. These are angels, guys. These are not the resurrected saints. Um, I just, I've talked about that in previous episode. It's resurrected saints are taken away from the wrath of the Lamb, stored away in the New Jerusalem to be kept safe. This is Yeshua come back with his angels. We're going to look at Joel here in just a minute. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. 
He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Again, it's not the Father sending himself, it's the Son. Two different people. Verse 16, he says, He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of King and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, that's the birds, come and gather yourself together into the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Okay. So this is him stopping the beast, the false prophet, Satan, the dragon coming back. This is happens at the seventh trumpet. Okay. It's at the end. It's at the, the sixth and seventh seal and the seventh trumpet. It's at the culmination of these events at 40, after 42 months. Joel chapter 2, 1 through 6. These are this army that comes with him. This is that fire that they're going to receive from the Father that we just read about. It says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. That's that seventh trumpet. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, for it is close at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There has not been ever the like. Neither shall any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A this is the, the army that is being described of the day of the Lord. It's the angels that come back with Yeshua. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is before them like the Garden of Eden, and behind them it is a desolate wilderness. Because they're going through, and they're just they're clearing out everything where the New Jerusalem is going to set down. They're cleaning everything with fire. So anything that gets in their way is going to get destroyed. Verse 5, uh, verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so they shall run. So this is saying that just like we read, you know, this, they're, they're all coming back on horses and they're the people that the riders of the horses are dressed in white. It's the angels, just like Yeshua comes back on a horse. Verse 5, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble as a strong people set in battle array, before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness, meaning that everyone's going to be scared to death, right? If you see you see all these angels coming at you, destroying everything with fire, you'd be scared to death. Verse 7 through 11, they shall run like mighty men. The, the angels of God, the, the army of the Lord, shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, meaning they're super strong and fast. They shall march everywhere on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. Either shall neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. So basically, you can't kill them. They're coming at you. They're not going to be routed by the enemy because they don't break ranks, and you're you have no chance of defeating them. Verse nine: They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up onto the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he's strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? It's that last trumpet, the end of the seals, the end of the 42 months. All the bold judgments have happened, and he coming back. he's coming back, guys. This is Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after that 42-month time period where the beast is, has the authority to go out and conquer, and he and death and hell are riding around, they've been given this authority through these seal judgments, all of it, after the tribulation of that time period, shall the sun and moon be darkened and not give their light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the, sign, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, guys. So the seal judgments, one through four, is happens at the start of the 42 months. This is what I have here on screen here for you. Seal one through four, as we read tonight, that's why I read them all for you. Okay, we went through all the verses and all the correlating verses with the timing and the details that match. I couldn't think of a way to make this more simplified. Seals 1 through 4 is the start of the 42 months. 
and some of them overlap with each other, just like seals one and seals four. King, the, the authority that's given to the beast is the same guy that's death and Hades that ride that ride out and start killing people. It's just explaining that this guy's given authority. If you read Revelation 13, it expounds that the beast who's given that authority to go out and conquer then gives his beast to the he to the second beast. He gives his authority to the second beast, the false prophet, who's who I could try to make a case later to call him Hades. We'll, we'll talk about that in that episode, and I think it's part uh, next week, maybe uh, part 14. Um, so seal number five is during persecution near the end. Seal number five, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, where the saints are crying out, when are you going to avenge us? And the angels tell the saints, be patient. Here's your white robes, meaning you're almost resurrected. Be ready. But just as you've been killed, there's other people that are still going to be killed before this is over. So this is during the persecution near the end of that 42-month time period. And then seal six and seven is the day of the Lord around the seventh trumpet. Okay? It's a little analytical breakdown for you trumpets one through five is the start of the 42 months trumpets one through five and we're going to go over this in greater detail uh, both from revelation isaiah and other places in scripture and future episodes okay future installments of this series when we talk about uh, the eye of Ra and mother babylon oh and ball top towers we're going to talk about trumpets one through five in greater detail, and I'm going to break down some of those things talked about. Okay. Start of that's at the start of that 42 month time period, just like the first four seals. Trumpet six is persistent war and persecution that lasts for 42 months. When the things that come out of the pit under the authority of Apollyon that had this chimera description to them, they go out and they persecute people. Okay, so this is they're they're gonna make they're gonna kill a third of mankind from the earth. And then trumpet seven is when the day of the Lord actually happens and the seventh seal is completed. And all the bold judgments happen at the end of the seals, the end of the trumpets, on the day of the Lord, all in one, these bowls of wrath are poured out together at the end of the forty two months. Okay. So like I said, we're going to go over more of this um, in greater detail as we do uh, next week. I've got the Mark of the Beast, or not next week. I hope I can get it done next week. The Mark of the Beast and then the Image of the Beast. And we're going to be talking about the second beast as a part of this. Um, and then Ball Top Towers is at part 18. Part 19 is Eclipses and the Eye of Ra. And then part 20 is Mother Babylon, the Dragon's Lair. And then part 21 we'll be reviewing as a final summation of all these concepts, evil empire versus the covenant kingdom. And hopefully by that time you will, you will either laugh me to scorn or you will realize that's why I've taken so much effort to put all this together in 21 parts by the time we get to part 21. Um, because it's for the most of you that, that have never heard me talk about this and you don't understand where I'm going with this. And specifically all the history that I went through and all the present day deceptions that use ancient history that I covered in the first 14 parts. If you guys don't understand where I'm going with all this and you've never heard me talk about it before, it, it'll it blow your mind. You Like I said, you'll either laugh and, and just disregard it because of the cognitive dissonance or it'll blow your mind and it'll hopefully allow you to see even further through the deceptions that are being perpetrated all over the place uh, consistently and why and i'm it not just it's i'm not just like a pointing out like we talked about in, in number 14 and uh, number 12 talk about the, the lies of nasa and the cia military experiments and all that kind of stuff it's not just recognizing these things that are happening but guys i'm going to be giving you the why this is why they do this this way, why they have they show you this stuff like this, why these things are happening, these strange word wordings and strange prophecies that are happening in Revelation and other places in scripture. I'm gonna give you the why.